voice that keeps on calling me Down the road, that's where I'll always be to all the, all the people around me is screw it just get on and do it <laughs> not gonna allow that to happen <laughs> i've failed I've, I've absolutely failed but we'll keep trying <laughs> anyway wow thanks there little doggo that nasty richard branson was trying to take away my socialized health care are you okay these billionaires are always trying to take our services just sometimes I wish we didn't have to just be fighting off the individual attacks of the rich people, trying to take our stuff, but we could be pushing forward to make the world better for all of us. I know what you mean. But you wouldn't know about that. You can't speak. You're just an innocent dog, free from the troubles of this human world, the tortures and pains of work, the trials and tribulations of employment. I can speak, you know, and I do know what you mean. I literally have a YouTube channel about this stuff. Didn't we actually just collaborate on a video just a few weeks ago? Oh, never mind. Oh, what's this? A video? Maybe this will bring some answers to help me with my plight. Lucky there's an old VHS player and TV in this dumpster right here. Hi everyone, so today I want to do something a bit different. Normally in these videos I try and highlight ideas which I think help us better critically understand the capitalist world we live in, and the right wing movements that would seek to worsen our conditions. But today I want to look the other way, look at the current condition of the left, and particularly the anarchist, libertarian, communist and autonomous left. That section of the left, not concerned with participating in liberal democratic structures, or with constructing a new authoritarianism on the other side of a revolution. I want to look at where we stand, what we are doing, and what strategies might be useful in moving us forward. And rather than doing a lot of philosophical work, I'm going to try and build to some practical suggestions. This video was actually originally an introduction to a much longer video, but I felt I was trying to pack everything about left action into one video, and that the subject might be better served by giving each topic the space of a whole video, rather than rushing through everything at once. So consider this video an introduction to an ongoing series. So to set up for this series, in this video I'll give a little 101 introduction about our aims as anarchists, and specifically my preferred tactical philosophy, anarcho-syndicalism. I will also release a second video soon, focusing on one of the main points from the original essay, and then I will add more videos exploring strategies and tactics for left-wing action over time. I was inspired to do this by my recent collaboration with Radical Reviewer discussing capitalist realism, link in the description if you haven't seen it, in which I reflected on how far the left has come in the last few years, and it has come a long way and done some astonishing things, but I also wanted to reflect on where the left is going, because proud as we should be of all we have achieved, there is still a long way to go. I was also inspired by reading the recent book by D. Hunter, Chav Solidarity, which is a very important text for people on the left, particularly in the UK, to be reading right now, in my opinion, and which I will explore some ideas from in the next part of this series. In examining all of this, I am going to favour a particular group of strategies and ideologies, but before I begin, I do want to note some of the serious problems with doing tactical and prefigurative work like this. So consider this next bit a kind of disclaimer. When selecting strategies, or trying to prefiguratively imagine what a future society will be like, we always come up against the unpredictability of the future. The result of this is, while many people have ideas about this stuff, no one really knows the answers to these questions, because we don't know what they are or could be. They haven't happened yet, and all historical examples have some problem at some point, otherwise we would have continuing, existing and growing anarchist socialist societies today. So consider this series my best informed guesses. 
I'm not claiming to have invented a new strategy, just to share some of the ideas I've formed through my own experience of radical theory and practice, which is by definition limited, and is entirely confined to the UK scene, with any information about activism in other countries being second-hand. Many of the ideas I want to talk about are pretty commonplace to be honest, though I think they are things that the left is bad at in practice in many cases. Also, as a believer in politics led from below, any prefigurative ideas I have about a future society are necessarily suggestions, as I believe the process of experimenting with how to live well together in a just society should be one led by those living in that society. So, even if I were in such a society myself, my opinion would only be one contribution to a wider debate. Therefore, the intention of this series is just to bring these ideas to people's minds and hopefully inspire them but also to spark a debate, so if you have any good faith ideas on how this branch of the left should proceed that either contradict or complement those I've expressed here, I would like to encourage inclusive, comradely debate in the comments, particularly on some of the later videos where I get into strategy a bit more, though I warn you bigoted, bad faith or abusive posts, just as with alt-right trolls, will be deleted without mercy. Remember, your free speech ends when it impinges on someone else's right to exist. Also, in the end, I think a diversity of tactics is generally useful, so if I haven't mentioned a tactic you think is important here, that doesn't necessarily mean I disapprove. Again, I'm neither an encyclopedia on this, nor infallible. In the parts I've planned of this series, I also want to mention I'm primarily going to focus on doing activism in real life. Online activism is great and has achieved a lot recently, certainly in terms of spreading our ideas to a wider audience and connecting radicals from around the world but I've only run this channel for a few months and have little other experience in organising online. So there are definitely people more experienced in online organising who can and do talk about these issues on YouTube. I also want to emphasise doing action in real life because, much as the internet is a great propaganda tool, if we are ever going to actually transform our societies for the better, it will, in my opinion at least, take more than internet culture. Yes, it globally connects individuals of similar ideology, but that will not take effect so easily if those individuals are not themselves organised in their own communities. But I'll come to that in more detail towards the end of this series. So with all of that said, let's get on with this. Today I'm going to start by talking about where we actually want to go through our organising. You seem stressed. Why don't we list all our favourite things until we feel better? I'll go first. Apples. A. Toppling on just hierarchies. Apples. Wait, I said that already. <laughs> Part 1. Where do we even want to go anyway? So the best place to start in forming any sort of strategy is by looking at what you want to achieve. So let's try and pin down some of the basic points here in very broad terms. But this is kinda Anarchism 101 stuff and there's a ton of videos out there on this so I'm going to try and keep this short and simple for now. And I will link to more in-depth material on the topic in the description. Basically, it seems to me that you should, one should think of anarchism as not a specific set of doctrines, but just a kind of a tendency in human thought and action, which tries to, in, to, to detect and discover structures of authority, domination, and hierarchy, and there are plenty of them, and to challenge them, ask them to demonstrate their legitimacy, uh, recognizing that they are not self-justifying. They have a burden of justification. That's true. Uh, all across the spectrum of human life, from the patriarchal families to uh, imperial systems and everything in between. Wherever you find a structure of domination, hierarchy, somebody giving orders, somebody taking them, whatever it may be, you have to ask, is that legitimate? Uh, you cannot assume that it, you shouldn't assume it's or, it is legitimate because it's been like that. As anarchist, libertarian or autonomist communists, we seek a world free of oppression by unjustified authority of any person or class over another, including the most defining expression of such authoritarianism in our culture, capitalism. Therefore, we wish to reconstruct our societies, to make it as difficult as possible to establish tyrannical or exploitative hierarchies, whether in the political, economic or social sphere. This includes executive control by individuals, hierarchies or class or hierarchies based on race, nationality, gender, sexuality, or any other sort of minority oppression. And yes, this includes trans people, so all you TERFs who call yourselves anarchists or socialists, of which we sadly have too many in the UK right now, can pretty well fuck off at this point as far as I'm concerned. Thanks. Anyway, back to the point. We recognise the global poverty, exploitation, dispossession, disempowerment and harm these systems cause, and we seek to end these horrors. 
The most common solution to this, and the one I would ideally favour, is to organise our society through direct democratic communes from the bottom up. This means everyone votes on every issue that affects them, at least as far as possible, and generally includes a demand for either large majorities or consensus. This democracy would extend through all parts of life, so you would democratically organise in your social and political community, i.e. where you live and the wider society, as well as in your workplace. Delegation of some power is often possible to groups for set time and for set tasks, and for some libertarian communists this does extend to a limited sitting government of sorts, but one which is very much accountable from below, as exists in the model currently in practice, as far as I understand it, in the Rojava Autonomous Region in Syria, where, as it stands at time of writing, an autonomous community does exist, which has fought off ISIS and still has to fight off the Turkish state, which is seeking to destroy them. If you don't know about this situation, it's well worth looking into. I'll put a couple of resources in the description to start you off. So this inclusive democracy, where everyone has a vote on each issue, makes it very difficult for someone to take executive power at the expense of others. But if everyone still has money, people can obviously buy votes and influence. So part of this process is also economic collectivization. Ideally, in my view, extending to the minimization and equal sharing of work by those capable of doing it and the sharing of resources to provide the most luxurious living conditions possible to everyone. This is often summed up as from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. Now, oh, you look like shit. You had a date last night? I mean, it was great. Until she asked me to stop seeing other girls. She's got a point, Gregor. Yeah, we're a communist state, but you don't have to personally service everybody. What is it that Mark said? To each according to his ability, and to each according to his needs. I don't think that's what he meant. No, that's exactly what I mean. Once we've done this, if we maximise the automation in our society, this may very well result in us working very little time, as there is less work to be done, moving us towards the often touted goal of fully automated luxury communism. This is also why we talk about collectively owning the means of production. If someone owns the means to make things beyond what they themselves can operate and is allowed to profit from that ownership, this necessarily means they're exploiting their workers by taking a share of their labour power for personal profit. I go into this in detail in part two of my Dark Side of Liberalism series, so that's where to look if you want this argument in more detail. Or of course, Reading Radical's Marxian Economics Made Easy series. Aside from capital and authority, the other big issue, which previous generations of the left were less aware of, and which adds extra urgency to our struggle, is climate change. Not that our struggles weren't urgent before, and even back in the 60s people talked about how, in the context of global poverty, imperialist wars and exploitation, a single non-revolutionary day was far bloodier than months of open revolution. But climate change is an existential threat to our species, and many others on this planet, and requires an immediate change in the energy used to base our production on in our society, something capitalism with its vested private interests due to the private and corporate ownership models on which the fossil fuel industry, like most businesses in our world, is based, as well as its valorization of profit and deliberate exclusion of externalities, such as the well-being of people and the planet, and its emphasis on infinite growth in a finite world, has proven itself categorically incapable of achieving. Therefore, we must try and achieve significant changes in this direction as soon as possible in order to minimise the oncoming disaster from capitalism's callous disregard for our planet and our lives. So that was super oversimplified, but it's a basic shape of the goals we are looking for. But that's a pretty big bucket list of things to achieve on a global scale. And even with the gains of the last decade, we're hardly in a great starting position. So how do we move from here to there? Well, by activism and organising, right? Educate, agitate, organise? Well, of course, but how we do that matters. In my view at the moment, there are some things the left is doing well at. However, there are some things which I also think we are doing very badly at, or are getting wrong. And certainly some things we need to do, which we are either not doing or doing very little of. And this is what I want to discuss over the course of this series. But before I get on to the current state of the left, I want to talk a bit more about the broad strategic angle I think we should be taking in trying to move forward from here to the world described above. Part 2. How do we get there? So this is a second part of the sort of anarchism 101 bit. Again, I'm going to do it quickly, and especially here when we're talking about the broad tactical methods. I want to emphasise that diversity of tactics is good, and that the scope for tactical variation is broad. I'm going to lay out some basics of my preferred tactical approach here, but this is a space where I think dogmatism can sometimes hold you back and where more than anything, no one can be sure of the right answers. So one idea that most libertarian communists share is that a radical overturn of capitalism and authority is unlikely to be carried out to the full extent by the state or capital itself. 
as the systemic power within the system will continually corrupt those sent to liberate us by this method, and the system will impose its interests through its structures, such as markets, civil services and military if need be, as we have seen in so many historic coups around the world. Therefore we favour an extra-parliamentary route to this goal. In practice, many Marxist-Leninist organisations do this by creating a vanguard, a small intellectual elite who leads the masses to revolution and to take over the government. But as anarchists, we generally want to avoid vanguardism and using the organs of the state, or at least minimise their use. And so, as far as possible, we would aim to have created the conditions for a classless society beforehand, and then take advantage of some point of rupture for capitalism to depose its residual structure and fully enact our better society. This can be called the strategy of building the new world in the shell of the old. One common approach to how to do this is through the strategic philosophy of anarcho-syndicalism, a modified version of which is the strategy I would be most inclined towards, though plenty of other anarchist and libertarian communist strategic viewpoints also exist and I think many do have things to offer, but this series is aiming to be more practical than philosophical, so I'll not go too deep into that here. If he doesn't get that crop picked, he goes belly up. Now you all know that, don't you? Yeah. You got to make that work for you. You use that, you gain strength. Strength? We have no strength. Strength comes in numbers. Strength comes in unity. If you look around, you got all the strength you need here. But I'll tell you this, it ain't gonna be pretty. It's gonna be a fight. You've got to be willing to back each other up. What you need is a union. A union? A union? Jared will never go for that. I don't think we planned on asking him. Anarcho-syndicalism, in its original form, is a model for building this new world from below through a movement of radical trade unions, which would federate together across industries to create a nascent structure of organisation and distribution, and to train the workers within them to make decisions collectively, ready to take control of their industries at a key moment. As Rudolf Rocker puts it, Just as the party is, so to speak, a unified organisation with definite political effort within the modern constitutional state, which seeks to maintain the present order of society in one form or another. So, according to the unionists' view, the trade unions are the unified organisation of labour and have for their purpose the defence of the producers within the existing society and the preparing for and practical carrying out of the reconstruction of social life in the direction of socialism. They have, therefore, a double purpose. One, to enforce the demands of the producers for the safeguarding and raising of their standard of living. Two, to acquaint the workers with the technical management of production and economic life in general and prepare them to take socio-economic organism into their own hands and shape it according to socialist principles. So, these two points are very important to take together. The second is to prepare people to take part in the future society but the first is to help them in the here and now by enforcing their demands on the bosses and improving their standard of living today. By this method, organisers are continually able to show their goodwill to workers, as well as showing how their values can make real life better. And of course, engaging in these struggles builds the essential collaborative skills and solidarity you will need as you continue to build for a new society in which workers are able to work the industries for themselves and not for their capitalist employers. Through workplace organising, we can and should allow workers to lead their own campaigns and identify their own aims, and help provide strategies to carry them through. This will build trust and solidarity and show how our ideas work, therefore creating an atmosphere in which your ideas are more likely to be taken seriously. In essence, if we want to stop people doing capitalism, we need to do anarchism, or communism, or socialism, or whatever you want to call it. And this is one of the major theories on what that looks like. Now, this philosophy had its height in the 1930s, when anarchist workers in the CNT in Spain had spent decades organising in this fashion and had built a strong presence in many industries in Spain, especially in regions like Catalonia. This is how they were ready when the fascist coup took place in 1936. And beyond just resisting fascism, they were able to collectivise Barcelona, and much of Catalonia, as well as other regions of Spain, due to their large organised presence in the industries and population. As the chaos subsided, this new revolutionary society began to function. Much of the Catalan economy was now being run by the workers themselves. In Barcelona, trams and cinemas, factories, department stores and even greyhound tracks were run by their own employees. The trade unions sought to food supplies. Union lorries drove out to the villages with goods to exchange for food. 
the CNT, the anarchist trade union, had been taken by surprise when the revolution began. It was anarchist militants who rallied the workers to take over their industries. Where the old bosses remained, they had to take orders from these workers' committees. Nearly 2,000 enterprises were collectivized in Catalonia, the greatest experiment in workers' self-management Western Europe has ever seen. The workers now set about improving their working conditions. Free medical care and adequate pensions were introduced. They were, however, crushed later after being stabbed in the back by the Stalinists, among other causes. But overall, they were probably one of the most successful libertarian left movements in history. We do not live in 1930s Barcelona, though. The world has changed. The strong connections of the 20th century union movement have gone, as have the established working class communities, all destroyed by neoliberalism. With this has come the falling security of jobs, increasingly leading many of us to a precarious existence, drifting between various professions. So we are now not so connected to our jobs, and in many workplaces unionising is rare or difficult. Further, trade unions only handle the economic side of society, and not the social or political realm which presents problems particularly today when many people identify more with the place that they live than the place that they work. Therefore, while I still think workplace organising is one of the most important things we can do as anarchists, I think this strategy needs some expansion, especially in the modern age, to include not just workplace but community organising, building local community groups, where again we can help people articulate and organise against their concerns, allow them to lead their own campaigns and in the process engage them in political theory and action, and by doing this we can build a stronger, more cohesive community which, like their union counterparts, are increasingly ready to function collectively to achieve their needs and to take their power back, as well as to mobilise in the event of a major point of rupture. Again, having these organised and cohesive communities and workplaces is, in many cases, a huge task in itself, and we certainly have a long way to go. How we go about this, and what problems we have at the moment on the left, will be the subject of future videos in this series. So, stay tuned. So thanks for listening everyone. So this has been quite a simple video, but it's really just an introduction to the upcoming series, and the first proper instalment of this series, where I will actually be examining some left-wing tactics in more detail, will be coming soon, so I hope you'll join me for that. On that note, I want to apologise to everyone for how long it's been since my last video, there's been a lot going on in my life, and I have myself been getting back into doing more action in real life, and there's been some interesting opportunities to do things like that around here lately. So, I hope all of you can understand, and I'd really like to thank all my subscribers and patrons for bearing with me through this little break. But I do hope to be having videos coming out much more frequently again as we come into the autumn now. And on that note, I'd really like to thank my patrons who helped make all of this possible, so massive thanks to Carly, Natty, Peter Benzoni, Revelo, Zabesian, A Wingless Monkey, Baffy and Kit, Becquerel, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Brett Long, Dan Wheatley, Das Martin, Eden Harris, Geshtin, James Dirktke, Jason Roger Morgan, John, Mr. Awesome B. Cool, Rain, Rory, Everybody Talks, Some Random Geek, The Cooler Noah, and Thought Slime. Lots of love to all of you, and thank you so much for your support and patience. And extra special thanks to George Soros. And if you'd like to add your name to that auspicious list of patrons, you can support me for as little as $1 a month. And that goes to help me eat and survive while I make these videos. And of course, if you want these videos to come more frequently, the more you give, the more time I can dedicate to making these videos, and the faster these videos can come. And finally, I'd like to thank the wonderful Catherine for doing the voice of Rudolf Rocker. Check out her channel in the description. The amazing Baphometrics for providing the original music for this video. And of course, my co-conspirator Blue the Gender for all their amazing work on the original graphics and animations for this and all the other videos on this channel. Not to mention, of course, the best dog on the left, Radical Reviewer, who very kindly played the littlest hobo in this video, and who, if you're lucky, may well reprise that role in the next part of this series. I mean, it's not really luck, they totally will, it's already recorded. So, I think that's about it. Thank you all very much, patrons and non-patrons alike, and I hope to see you all again for the next part of this series very, very soon. Bye!